Okay, so I think you can now see my screen. Okay, welcome everyone. Yeah. Um, welcome to today's webinar. This event is part of a four episode um, series of seminars that CMCC has organized for the month of September, all focusing on the Arctic system and its predictability. And it's a great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Mitch Bushuk from the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory in Princeton, who will um, discuss with us about his recent work um, on, on um, entitled Prospects for Improved Regional Predictions of Arctic Sea Ice. Um, so thank you, Mitch, for accepting our invitation to, to speak to us today and taking the time to uh, share your work with us. We really appreciate it. And it's nice to have you as part of this uh, event. Um, so I'd like to say a few uh, words about um, a few more words about our speaker. So Mitch received his PhD um, from the Center for Atmosphere Ocean Science at New York University's uh, Koran Institute of Mathematical Sciences. He then moved to um, uh, Princeton to work as a postdoctoral research associate at GFDL. And he is now um, a research scientist there working on CIS prediction and predictability and on polar oceanography. Um, he has produced extensive work, research work on understanding and improving CIS predictability and prediction, especially at seasonal to interannual timescales, and using a variety of GFDL model experiments, perfect model predictability ensembles, as well as um, data simulation runs and observational data sets. Um, also on behalf of GFDL, he has been submitting reports, uh, sorry, predictions of September sea ice extent to the sea ice outlook reports, as well as monthly sea ice predictions to the extended sea ice prediction network. He's also a member of the American Meteorological Society Committee for Polar Meteorology and Oceanography. And I'd also like to add that another important aspect of Mitch's work is that um, a lot of his work has been focusing on regional scales of prediction, which are absolutely crucial for skillful operational forecasts for sea ice, both in the Arctic and the Antarctic. And this brings me back to today's talk, as today he will tell us more about some recent advances in regional prediction of, of Arctic sea ice. Okay, so before I leave the floor to Mitch, I'd just like to quickly um, present some slides on CMCC, just for those in the audience who may not be um, as familiar with our center. So this shouldn't take too long, just bear with me a few minutes. Okay, so I hope you can see my screen. Okay, so CMCC is um, an acronym for the Euro Mediterranean Center on Climate Change. And it's a non-profit research organization that was established in 2005 to then become a research foundation in 2015. And at CMCC, um, we carry out research that covers a wide range of, of, of topics to do with climate science and climate change. Um, and so the, with the ultimate goal of promoting sustainable growth, but also developing strategies for climate change mitigation and adaptation. So the center is organized in the form of a network, which has locations distributed all across the country, all across Italy. Uh, so the headquarters of CNCC are located in the city of Lecce, which is in the south of Italy, uh, which is also home to uh, supercomputing facilities. But we also have centers in Caserta, uh, Sassari, Sardinia, Viterbo, Milan, Venice, and Bologna, which is where we're currently hosting this, this webinar from. Um, and as well as this internal network of, um, of, of, research, of researchers, um, the center also benefits from collaborations with other institutional partners, including universities such as the University of Bologna, the University of Venice and other research centers. So each one of these locations um, hosts one or more research divisions. Um, in total, CMCC has 11 research divisions which all share different knowledge and skills on climate science and climate change. So I'm not going to read all of them, but if you're interested or would like to find out more, I encourage you to check out our website where you can find all information about CMCC, but also about what um, the sort of research that each one of these divisions um, produces. Um, so because of the large number of divisions, as you can imagine, the range of topics um, that are covered by CMCC are, is very broad. So we go from the more 
um, physical science aspects of climate change, so uh, advanced computing, for example, um, numerical uh, modeling and simulations and predictions at different timescales, uh, ocean modeling and data simulation as well, but also to aspects related to climate change adaptation and mitigation, uh, risk assessment and analysis of the impact of uh, climate the impacts of climate change on the economy, society, um, ecosystem services, poverty, and so on, all the way to global climate policy. Um, so finally, um, the way CMCC is involved with and sort of contributes to the wider scientific community happens on different levels. So mainly through the um, publication of scientific articles for international journals, but also also through um, several communication events, so um, webinars like the one you're attending now, but also uh, outreach events of different types that aim to communicate our research and science in ways that are not um, necessarily academic. And finally, CMC is also proudly involved in different education programs, including um, several postgraduate and PhD uh, programs. Okay, so before I wrap up, I just have a couple of housekeeping rules for this webinar. So as um, you probably realize by now, your audio and video are deactivated automatically and will stay switched off throughout the duration of uh, Mitch's talk. But you are allowed and actually encouraged to take part to a discussion session at the end of the webinar um, and ask all questions you might have. So you essentially have two options to do so. The first option is to use the raise hand feature at the, bottom, at the bottom of your screen. And in this case, at the end of the webinar, we can try and unmute your microphone and so you can ask your questions directly to our speaker. The other option, which is even easier, is to write all questions you might have, um, even during the presentation, by simply typing them in the dedicated Q&A chat. And in this case, I will then collect your questions at the end of the talk, at the end of the talk, and um, read them out to Mitch so he can answer them. Okay, so one last uh, note, this webinar will be recorded, is being recorded, and uh, will also be uploaded on the CMCC YouTube channel. If you have any questions regarding the seminar, you can direct all your queries to webinar at cmcc.it. And also don't forget to follow us on, on social media channels. Um, I'd also like to remind you of our next webinar in the series. So as I mentioned before, this event is part of a series of webinars on the Arctic, yes, on the Arctic system. Uh, so the next and final uh, webinar of this series will happen next week on Tuesday the 28th at 5 p.m. Central European time. And our speaker for this um, webinar will be Edward Blanchard Wrigglesworth from the Department of Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Washington. So if you haven't done so already, you can go and register for this webinar so you don't um, miss this final uh, event. Uh, and Mitch, of course, if you have time, you're more than welcome to, to join us in attending this webinar too. Uh, okay, so I think I said everything I had to say, so I can now um, stop sharing my screen and stop sharing my screen and switch off my oh, my microphone and camera. And um, Mitch, thank you so much again for being with us today. You can share your screen now, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks. Thanks so much, Elena, for that great introduction. Um, let me just quickly. Okay, so is that is that visible to you right now in presenter mode? Yes, it is. Okay, beautiful, great. Yeah, so um, uh, yeah, th thanks again, Elena, for that introduction, and uh, thanks for the invitation to come speak today to to all of you. Um, thanks for taking the time to log in and listen to this webinar as well. Um, so just before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the many people who have contributed to various aspects of what I'll be speaking about today. Um, their names are all listed here. There's a few too many to read them all off, but um, just want to say a big thanks to all those people. Oops, okay, here we go. So the starting point for today's talk is this famous time series of September Arctic sea ice extent. So over the last 41 years, we've been collecting these passive microwave satellite observations of sea ice from space. And the, the observational record has documented a striking decline in sea ice extent in all months of the year. And the decline is strongest in the late summer melt season and uh, it 
it peaks in September in terms of the trend. So you can see this very striking negative trend line, but in addition to the trend, it's also punctuated by this really fascinating interannual variability of sea ice. And so there's been some very you know, interesting years in the record, this, this high, high year in 96, these low years in 2007, 2012, and 2020. Um, and the sea ice community has become very interested in trying to explain what causes these interannual anomalies and crucially, are they predictable? Now we're coming up to the end of the 2021 melt season. And so we'll, we'll be adding a new data point to this time series very shortly. And we're expecting the, the 2021 minimum to come in somewhere around 4.9 million square kilometers, which you can see is a little bit above the long-term trend line, um, but, all, but quite a bit below the, um, the earlier climatology, of course. So this question of can we predict September sea ice um, has been sort of formalized by this nice effort called the sea ice outlook. And the sea ice outlook um, collates predictions from um, sea ice groups all around the world of September sea ice extent, pan-Arctic September sea ice extent. So they're predicting one number, which is the, the total aerial coverage of sea ice in the Arctic. And here I'm showing the, the predictions that were collected in June of this year. And keeping in mind that the observed value is going to come in somewhere around 4.9 million square kilometers, you can see that most groups are going to be um, under predicting this year's observed sea ice extent. Um, and there's quite a big range in the different predicted values, ranging from you know, values around 3.5 million square kilometers up to values above 5 million square kilometers. Um, so kind of a natural question that you probably have looking at this plot is, do we think sea ice is predictable? Is it possible to make a skillful prediction from June? Um, and so there's been a lot of work done on this question over the last decade or so. Um, and there's been a number of these so-called um, sources of predictability for sea ice identified. So the first really key source of predictability for sea ice comes from radiative forcing. Um, so if you take a modern climate model, and if you force it with um, observations of greenhouse gas concentrations and um, aerosol forcings and other radiative forcings, what you find is that most models are able to capture the observed decline shown in black quite accurately. So the, the CMIP-6 multi-model ensemble mean is shown in gray here. And there's certainly a number of issues with these models. They're far from perfect. But if you put in the right radiative forcing, you can see that you can capture most of the trend in sea ice quite accurately. So in terms of sort of decadal to multi-decadal timescales, the radiative forcing is, is capturing a good fraction of the variability that we're seeing in sea ice. Now, if we move to the, the seasonal to interannual timescale, a whole other suite of mechanisms become more relevant. Um, the, the first such mechanism is the simple um, persistence of sea ice extent anomalies. So if, if you compute lag correlations of sea ice extent anomalies with themselves, you find that there's a characteristic sort of decorrelation timescale of, of about two or three months. And you can imagine that, you know, just the simple persistence of sea ice extent anomalies is going to give you some predictability for those sea ice extent anomalies. Now, compared to sea ice extent, um, sea ice thickness tends to have longer temporal autocorrelation timescales, and it also tends to have larger spatial scale anomalies, so larger spatial autocorrelation link scales as well. And both of these facts mean that sea ice thickness anomalies tend to be more predictable than sea ice extent anomalies. And crucially, sea ice thickness couples very strongly with sea ice extent and area anomalies in the summer months. And so the predictability associated with sea ice thickness can act as a key source of predictability for late summer sea ice extent anomalies. Upper ocean heat content is another very crucial source of sea ice predictability. Um, and this is especially relevant in the fall and winter months. Um, and the reason for this is the, the heat content in the upper ocean determines how easy or hard it will be to form new sea ice, to basically freeze the upper layer of ocean water. So if you have an anomalously warm ocean, it's going to be harder to cool down that mixed layer, and you're going to tend to have negative sea ice extent anomalies the following winter. And then vice versa, if your ocean is anomalously cool, you tend to um, form more sea ice than normal, and you tend to have these positive sea ice extent anomalies. Atmospheric modes of variability are another key source of predictability. 
And, and here I'm showing the loading, the loading pattern of the NAO or the North Atlantic Oscillation, which tends to, tends to drive these, these dipole sea ice concentration anomalies between the Labrador Sea and the Barents and Kara Seas. And there's been some really nice recent work coming out of the Met Office that, showed, that has showed that the NAO index is predictable months in advance and maybe even up to a year in advance. And so you, so you can imagine that you know, via this loading pattern, if you can predict the NAO with some skill in advance, that should give you some predictability for sea ice extent anomalies in these regions. And finally, there's been some nice recent work on the possible role of large scale ocean circulation. And um, one of the key mechanisms that's been highlighted here is a relationship between the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation or AMOC and the corresponding modulation in ocean heat transport um, into the Arctic. And then this ocean heat transport thereby modulates the delivery of heat to the sea ice, both laterally as well as vertically. And so the idea here is that if you could predict the AMOC um, with some skill, that should give you some knock-on base skill for sea ice anomalies in the Arctic. And we think that this skill could potentially become relevant at the, the interannual to decadal time scale, sort of the time scales of, of AMOC variability. So another very key source of um, our knowledge re regarding sea ice predictability comes from these so-called perfect model predictability experiments that Elena mentioned. Um, and so I, I don't want you to process, process everything that's on this slide. There's a lot of plots here. But the key point I want to leave you with is these perfect model experiments are designed to estimate the upper limits of predictability achievable within a given model. They've been performed with a number of different GCMs. And they've shown that Pan-Arctic sea ice extent is potentially predictable between 12 and 36 months in advance. So this gives us some good reason to think that we should be able to make skillful predictions of Pan-Arctic sea ice extent on this seasonal to interannual timescale. Now, a, a key point is that everything I've mentioned so far has been focused on this single number, which is Pan-Arctic sea ice extent. And of course, for any um, user, or you know, community member living in the Arctic, um, they just aren't that interested in a single number, which is the total area of all Arctic sea ice. They want much more regional or ideally local scale type information. So as a community, we've been trying to move beyond this pan-Arctic paradigm and move towards more of this regional and local scale. And we've been trying to answer questions such as, you know, for example, can we predict the sea ice extent in a given region? For example, in the, the Laptev Sea shown here. Can we predict um, the opening and closing of shipping routes along the, the Northeast Passage or along the Northwest Passage? Can we predict um, extreme events in the Arctic, such as, for example, the formation of these sea ice arches that form in the Lincoln Sea and also in the Narrow Strait? Or for example, can we predict the, the presence or absence of these interesting Polynya events that have been uh, observed to form north of Greenland in some recent winters? There's also a lot of um, very exciting applications related to ecosystems and biology. And one such um, example is in, um, in the Bering and Barents Sea, the, the fish stocks tend to um, follow the, the sea ice edge position quite closely. And so you can imagine that if you could predict the position of the sea ice edge, you'd have some advanced knowledge of where the fish stocks are going to be in a given year. And that knowledge could be very useful for helping to manage the fisheries and, and manage the, the catch and also where people are doing the fishing in order to keep the, both the, the fish populations you know, sustainable as well as keep the, the fisher people safe. Okay, so that brings me to the out outline for today's talk. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna be focusing on, on regional predictability and prediction of sea ice. I'm going to start by just briefly introducing two seasonal prediction systems that we've developed in recent years at GFDL. These are called the, the spear medium and floor seasonal prediction systems. And then I'm going to really focus in primarily on one application, which is looking at making summer regional sea ice predictions and highlighting this so-called spring predictability barrier feature that arises when you try to do this. Okay, so both floor and spear medium are prediction systems that are based on fully coupled global dynamical models. Um, each of these models has um, the same resolution of nominally half degree in the atmosphere and land components, 
and a coarser resolution of one degree in the ocean and sea ice components. The Spear Medium System is our, our latest generation seasonal prediction system that was, um, it was introduced earlier this year and we started making these quasi operators. Um, and this uses all of GFDL's um, latest CMIP6 model components. And then the floor system was correspondingly retired earlier this year. And this was our previous generation system that was developed back in 2012 using a lot of our CMIP5 model components. Now, a key aspect of these systems is how we initialize the, the seasonal forecasts. So in both systems, we're assimilating um, coupled observations of the Earth system. In the ocean, we're assimilating satellite sea surface temperatures and temperature and salinity profiles coming from Argo floats, XBTs, and moored buoys. And in the floor system, we also assimilate CTD and some other world ocean database profile types as well. On the atmospheric side, we're assimilating three-dimensional temperature data from NCEP2 reanalysis with six hourly frequency. And in Spear Medium, we're assimilating three-dimensional temperature, wind, and humidity data from the CFSR reanalysis, also with six hourly frequency. In terms of sea ice data, we aren't assimilating any sea ice in the floor system, and we're using sea ice concentration observations to adjust under ice SST values in the Spear Medium system. And in both of these systems, we're using a, a coupled data simulation approach based on an ensemble Kalman filter run of the full coupled model. And in Spear Medium, we have an additional run, which is a, a nudged atmosphere and SST run, where we, we, we nudge the atmosphere and SSTs to observations. And we use this nudge run to initialize the, the sea ice, atmosphere, and land components. And so using these systems, we've ran these uh, suites of retrospective seasonal predictions. And so these are predictions initialized on the first of each month and run for one year of time as an ensemble. And we've done this for the time period spanning 1992 up to 2020. And just to give you an idea of how the system is performing, here I'm showing predictions of uh, September Arctic sea ice extent with the observations being shown in black and the colored lines here indicating predictions um, at various lead times ranging from September 1st back to June 1st. And what you can see is that both systems have some skill at capturing both the downward trend in sea ice, but additionally, they're also capturing um, some degree of these interannual anomalies that we're seeing in the sea ice extent. Um, and you can quantify this skill using the anomaly correlation coefficient or ACC. And you can see that the ACC values in both systems are quite high, indicating that there is indeed prediction skill at these lead times. Um, and, and interestingly, if you um, look at the detrended anomaly correlation coefficient. So the detrended ACC comes from first removing the linear trend from both time series and then computing the correlation. Um, what we find is that there's also skill at predicting the interannual anomalies relative to this long-term linear trend. And you can see that the new Spear medium system generally has higher detrended correlations. And we found that the main reason for this is due to improvements both in sea ice thickness as well as sea ice extent initial conditions in this new system compared with the earlier floor system. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on to the next part of the talk, which is focusing on, in on this so-called spring predictability barrier feature. So I'll start off with the definition. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna define the spring predictability barrier as a springtime date such that predictions initialized on or after that date can skillfully predict summer sea ice, whereas predictions initialized prior to that date cannot. So as an illustration here, I'm showing our detrended anomaly correlation coefficients for the, the Laptev Sea and East Siberian Seas, which are these two shelf, shelf seas just north of Siberia. And in these plots, I'm plotting um, ACC values, detrended, for different target months. So these are the months that we're trying to predict along the x-axis and then different forecast lead times going from 0 to 11 months along the y-axis. And you can see this characteristic diagonal correlation structure that emerges in these plots. And in these plots, um, diagonal lines correspond to common initialization times. So what we see here is that the dashed line indicates the May 1st initialized forecast. And what we see is that any forecast initialized May 1st or later can skillfully predict summer sea ice extent, whereas any forecast initialized prior to May 1st cannot. 
In other words, there appears to be a barrier of predictability in these systems corresponding to roughly a date of May 1st. And if we look at the, the, the spear medium system, um, we again see um, a similar sort of diagonal correlation structure. Now in this system, we see a, a big jump in correlation for forecast initialized June 1st or later. And so you can sort of see this triangular, triangular wedge of correlations located here. Um, we also see a similar diagonal structure in the East Siberian Sea. Um, and there's also some interesting skill that's a bit higher in the months of June and November, which I'm not gonna go into here, but we can maybe loop back to that in the Q&A if you're interested. And then just very briefly, the, the third column here shows the difference between spear and floor. So it's spear minus floor. And you can again see that spear medium has um, improved detrended correlation coefficient values. And again, that's associated with the improved sea ice extent and sea ice thickness initial conditions in this system. Okay, so I, I've shown that there appears to be a spring barrier in these two models. Um, but a natural question that, that we had and that many people asked us is, is the spring barrier actually robust across other models? In other words, is this a real thing or is this just some you know, sort of error in the GFDL models and the GFDL prediction systems? So to get at that question, we first ran a series of these perfect model predictability experiments with the floor model. And again, these perfect model experiments are designed to quantify the upper limits of prediction skill within this system. And what we found is that in these perfect model experiments, again, this diagonal correlation structure was found in the East Siberian and Laptev seas. So what this tells you is that even with perfect knowledge of the initial sea ice thickness, the initial atmosphere conditions, and the initial ocean conditions, um, the model is still unable to overcome the spring predictability barrier. So this suggests that the predictability barrier is an inherent feature of the model, and it's not tied to some issue with the initial conditions, for example, in our seasonal forecast systems. Okay, now ideally to assess other models, we'd have similar perfect model experiments available for other GCMs in CMIP5 and CMIP6. We generally don't have those experiments available to us. So we have to come up with a, a different way of assessing the predictability of different GCMs. Um, and what we came up with was a very simple technique, which is if you simply use regional sea ice volume as a predictor of future sea ice area, what you find is that the sea ice volume based predictor can do quite well at capturing most of the skill of the full perfect model. So here I'm, I'm simply plotting lag correlations where I look at sea ice area in a given target month, and then I correlate that with the earlier sea ice volume in that region. Um, and the, the difference between this basic linear regression model and the perfect model is shown in the third panel here. And you can see that at, at short lead times, um, sort of on the, you know, on the, the weather to one month time scale, there is certainly a lot more skill in the perfect model. And you can see that here. And we think that's coming from predictability that's present in the atmosphere, which you wouldn't be capturing from this sea ice volume based regression prediction. Nonetheless, if you look at longer lead times of one, two, three, and four months, you can see that this very simple regression-based model is doing a pretty good job at capturing most of the perfect model skill. And so what this tells us is that regional sea ice volume is providing the dominant source of summer sea ice area predictability. Um, and the nice thing about this is that we can then take this simple um, regression-based model and we can diagnostically apply it to other GCMs in the CMIP five and six ensembles. So um, this is exactly what we did. And this, this, this is a project I should mention. This project was led, led by Dave Bonin, who did this with us as a, um, an internship um, during his undergrad. And Dave's now a PhD student working with uh, Andy Thompson at Caltech. And so what, what Dave did is he took CMIP five control runs and he computed these lag correlations between sea ice area and earlier sea ice volume. And here I'm showing the results from one such CMIP model, the access model. And again, we see this diagonal correlation structure emerging. Um, and I should also mention that the squares on this plot indicate the, the month of maximum decorrelation for each target month. So what you see is that the, the maximum decorrelation occurs going from the month of June to the month of May in this model. And that maximum decorrelation consistently occurs going from June to May. In other words, there appears to be a spring barrier in, in this model. 
Now here's another model. This is the CAN ESM2 model. Um, again, we see a diagonal correlation structure emerging. And again, we see sort of this barrier type behavior. Here's another model, the uh, GFDL ESM2G model. Um, again, kind of a similar story with sort of a diagonal correlation structure and what looks to be a spring barrier. And then we, we just turned the crank and we did this for all of the CMIP5 control runs that we could, we could get our hands on. I think this was around 35 models or so. And what we found is that this diagonal correlation structure is remarkably robust across CMIP5 models. So nearly every model in the CMIP5 archive um, has what appears to be a spring predictability barrier. Um, there are some important differences. In particular, there's a lot of variability in the, the strength of these correlations between different models. So the amount of predictability that you would attribute to CA's volume changes quite a bit from model to model. There's also differences in the timing of the barrier, with some models showing more of a June barrier, other models showing more of a May barrier. Um, and then, of course, there are a few models, such as this one here, that don't show much of a barrier at all. Um, but I would argue in the world of CMIP multi-model comparisons, this barrier looks to be a very robust feature. So this kind of leads to the natural question. Um, what is the physical mechanism for the spring predictability barrier? Um, in particular, we know that these, these CMIP5 models have very different formulations of sea ice model physics. They have different ocean and atmospheric components and resolutions. Um, they, and as a result, they have very different biases in terms of both Arctic sea ice extent and Arctic sea ice volume. So it was interesting that, you know, despite this, this big spread across models, they all seem to be getting this predictability barrier quite consistently. And so we, we wanted to understand kind of why that was. And so to get, to get at that question, we did a, a sea ice mass budget analysis using daily data from two large ensembles, one run with the, the floor model and one run with the CESM1 model from NCAR. Um, both these large ensembles used historical and RCP 8.5 radiative forcings. And crucially, each of these large ensembles saved daily sea ice mass budget diagnostics, which allowed us to do the analysis that I'm about to show you. So in, in each of these models, the sea ice mass evolves according to the following tendency equation. So you can change sea ice mass due to melt from the top, melt from the bottom, growth from the bottom, as well as ice dynamics, which comes in the form of this, this mass transport convergence term, where U here is the velocity field of the sea ice. And so for both models, I'm going to show three diagnostics. Um, a, a melt diagnostic, which is the mass flux associated with top, bottom, and side melt. A growth diagnostic, which is the mass flux associated with both so-called congelation as well as frazzle sea ice growth. And finally, an export term, which is this mass transport conversions term coming from sea ice dynamics. So just, so just to give you a flavor for what these terms look like, here I'm showing the mass budget climatology for the lap tev C. Um, in FLOR and CESM. And you can see that there's quite good qualitative agreement between the two models. They, they start growing sea ice in the fall. The growth peaks in November. It stays high for the winter. And then it starts to ramp down in the spring and essentially turns off in the summer. And when the growth turns off, the melt term turns on. And you can see that we were melting a lot of ice in the summer and the melt term peaks in the month of July. And then the green curve shows the the export climatology. And um, negative values here indicate that ice is being advected out of the domain. So climatologically in the winter, we're tending to push ice out of the domain. I should mention here that I'm showing these for the Laptev Sea. Um, and this is consistent with the well-known um, coastal divergence of sea ice that form that, that happens during the winter in this region. So you tend to get a lot of storms sweeping up the North Atlantic storm track. And those storms tend to um, export ice away from the coastline and out of the domain. So you can see that both models are getting that export in the winter. They get a little bit of ice in import into the domain over the summer, and then they start exporting ice again the following winter. Um, one other note is that you can see that even in the climatology, this export term has a lot of high frequency noise in it. And this is because the export variations are largely driven, as I mentioned, by this synoptic variability in the atmosphere. And so even in the, in the daily climatology, there's quite a bit of noise associated with just how noisy this export term is. 
okay, so, so now what we did with the sea ice mass budget is we reconstructed the sea ice mass anomalies by simply taking the tendency equation and just doing the time integral of the source terms on the right-hand side. And then what we did is we took these source terms and we broke them up into a climatological contribution and an anomalous contribution. And what that let us do was to, to obtain a reconstructed sea ice mass time series consisting of um, a, a mass climatology plus mass anomalies corresponding to growth, melt, export, and the initial anomaly. Okay, so just to give you a feel for what these terms look like, here I'm showing one particular year of sea ice mass evolution, starting on October 1st and running through to the next October 1st. And I've, I've converted the mass to an equivalent thickness anomaly. And so you can see that we start with an, an anomaly of around uh, 0.3 meters. And over the course of the, the year, we steadily build up an, an, an anomaly of about one meter, which appears kind of the following summer. So now we can look at the different um, terms in the mass budget to understand the, the drivers of the sea ice mass anomaly. Um, firstly, if we look at the growth term, we can see that the, the growth term is actually, if anything, it's acting to oppose the positive thickness anomaly that we're seeing here. So it's certainly not driving this thickness anomaly. And if anything, it's, it's tending to pull, pull the thickness anomaly back towards the model's climatology. And this is happening for a good reason. There's, there's a well-known negative feedback between ice thickness and ice growth rates. In particular, in, in this case, we have anomalously thick ice. And that thick ice, is it, uh, it conducts less heat through it throughout the fall and winter months. And that means it grows um, less quickly than normal. And, that, and those lower than normal growth rates act to basically pull the, the model state back towards the climatology via this negative feedback. Okay, so now if we look at the export term, you can see very strikingly that the, the export term clearly is explaining nearly all of the, the high frequency synoptic fluctuations in ice thickness that we're seeing in this region. Um, and we also see that kind of there's a, a, a broader scale slow development of a positive thickness anomaly over the fall, winter, and spring months. And then finally, if we look at the melt term, you can see that the melt term is essentially off for the, the winter and spring months, and then it turns on in the month of May. And the month of May is really a critical time because you can see that the, the thickness anomaly goes from about half a meter in mid-May up to about a meter by early July. And then that positive thickness anomaly is able to persist all the way through the melt season um, to the end of the melt season. And what we find is that if we look at sea ice concentration, which is shown in cyan here, that positive thickness anomaly tends to slow down melt rates and that acts to give you a positive anomaly in sea ice concentration, which is of course the thing that we're ultimately trying to predict. So kind of putting this all together, this is suggestive of a mechanism for the spring predictability barrier. Um, in particular, um, during the winter, the sea ice and thickness anomalies are lost via this negative feedback from growth. And also they're largely driven by this export term, which, um, which is very noisy because it's quite synoptic. And so the export term does almost kind of a random walk through the winter. And it's doing this random walk, which is fairly unpredictable due to the fact that the atmosphere is fairly unpredictable. But nevertheless, we do end up with some sort of sea ice thickness anomaly in the early part of May. And then the melt term kicks in. And the melt term kicks in via the ice albedo feedback to take whatever anomaly we had and enhance it. And this is because the ice albedo feedback is a, a positive feedback that happens in the Arctic. And there's two main ice albedo feedbacks that are active here. One is an aerial-based feedback associated with the fact that this thicker ice tends to have more aerial coverage. And so you get the classic aerial-based ice albedo feedback. But there's an, additionally a feedback that happens associated with the thickness of the ice. And um, that feedback arises because um, thicker ice tends to be both colder and also tends to have more snow on top of it. And both of those um, factors tend to increase the albedo of the surface, and that tends to um, give you less melt than normal, which gives you this positive thickness anomaly from the melt term. So we're getting sort of two forms of ice albedo feedback, but the key point is that the ice albedo feedback 
acts in a very predictable way on this anomaly. It acts to enhance, oops, it acts to enhance the anomaly. And then the anomaly is able to persist all the way through to the end of the melt season. Okay, so we can look at this a bit more rigorously by doing a, a formal covariance composition, decomposition of the mass anomaly. And so what I'm showing here are covariances between September 1st sea ice area and earlier sea ice mass. And the magenta curve shows the, the covariance with the full mass anomaly. And you can see that starting in, starting in May, we get this rapid growth in covariance. In other words, this rapid increase in predictability. And this rapid increase in predictability is the signature of this spring predictability barrier. And now what we can do is we can, by, by the linearity of the covariance operator, we can take these mass anomalies and we can decompose this full covariance into contributions from each, each of the mass budget terms. And what we find is that, as, as expected, the growth term is acting to provide negative covariance. In other words, it's producing predictability. The export term is producing a lot of covariance, but crucially, there's no sort of kink or rapid rise in predictability associated with the timing of the spring barrier. So the export term is not controlling the spring barrier. And then finally, it is indeed the melt term that is ramping up in the month of May, and that's causing this covariance to grow rapidly. And so we find that in both models, that it is indeed the melt term that's driving the rapid increase in predictability associated with the spring barrier. Now, if you squint really hard at these, you can see that th there's slightly different melt onset timing in these two models. So the melt term turns on on roughly May 15th in the floor model, and it turns on on roughly June 1st in the CESM model. And what we find is that if you look at the lag correlations between sea ice area and earlier sea ice mass, and I, I've also added dash lines indicating the melt onset dates in both, both, in both models, you can see that after the melt onset date, the predictability kind of rapidly jumps up in floor. And similarly, it, it jumps up just after the melt onset date in CESM. And so the fact that the fact that CESM has this later melt onset date by, by roughly two weeks indicates that its predictability barrier happens about two weeks later. And this has some important implications for climate change, for example, because we expect under climate change, the Arctic to warm and for melt onset to happen earlier in the season. And so we expect that under climate change, the spring barrier is gonna shift a little bit earlier into the melt season due to, um, due to the earlier melt onset. Okay, so I'm basically done. I just wanna leave you with one quick final point. And um, a crucial idea here is that if the spring barrier is set by the timing of melt onset, what that means is that we really need thickness observations to initialize our forecasts after the melt onset date. So between June 1st and September 1st. Now over the last, um, over the, the last decade or so, and, and even prior to that as well, we've been collecting these remote sensing based observations of sea ice thickness from space. And there's been a quasi continuous record starting in 2010 coming from the Cryosat 2 satellite and then recently also the, the newly launched ISAT 2 satellite. Um, but both these satellite products currently only provide observations that roughly span the middle of October until the middle of April. And the reason for this is that um, the, retrie the, the retrieval algorithms to um, retrieve the thickness from satellites um, depend crucially on differentiating between the height of the ice surface and the height of the ocean, which typically is found by identifying a lead or a crack in the sea ice adjacent to the ice surface. Um, now in the spring, these surface melt pond features form over the Arctic, and these corrupt um, most of the satellite retrieval algorithms that are currently in use. And so that means that we don't have data um, beyond April 15th currently. And so we're, we're really pushing to try to get this data, you know, pushed towards June 1st and ideally, you know, into the summer months as well. And there's some really great work being done in the remote sensing community at the moment on this. And, and um, we're seeing some really exciting kind of new products just starting to come out now, which could potentially provide us this, this summer sea ice thickness data that we think is really critical. Great, so with that, I will wrap up. Um, so we've shown that the, the spear and floor prediction systems skillfully predict both Pan-Arctic and regional sea ice extent. And we found that this spring Arctic sea ice predictability barrier is a robust feature of CMIP-5 models as well as seasonal prediction systems. And we made an argument that the spring predictability barrier results from the combination of unpredictable wintertime mass variations driven by ice export 
and predictable mass variations driven by ice albedo feedbacks beginning in the month of May. And um, this result, these results imply that summer sea ice thickness observations collected after the melt onset date are especially critical for improving summer sea ice forecasts. So um, these are the references that I spoke about to some degree today in this talk, if you're interested in reading, reading further. Um, I didn't have a chance to talk about predictions in other months of the year, but if you're, if you're interested in those, I'm happy to take some questions on other months as well. Um, so yeah, so with that, I think I will just say a big thanks to everyone for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mitch. That was very interesting. Um, very, very interesting. Thank you. So um, I don't see any questions now in the Q&A chat um, at the moment. Um, so maybe we'll wait a few seconds for people to start thinking about the questions. Um, I can start with with a question of my own, if you don't mind. Um, it's more of a curiosity, but um, something I find quite fascinating, but also a bit difficult to get my head around is the role of snow on sea ice. And, um, and especially going back to the, the plot where you were showing all these um, feedback mechanisms between thickness and growth, and especially thinking about the, the timing of melt, oh, sorry, uh, of melt onset, sorry, yes. Um, how, how would you say um, does the absence or presence of snow um, play a role in all this? Like would those feedbacks change, for example, and are these, is this something that is, is um, addressed in the, uh, currently in the models that you showed us? Yeah, that's a great, great question. Um, so snow comes in, I guess, in, in two varieties. Um, first of all, we, we did start off with some Sorry, let me just move this. Um, so we, we started off with a small positive thickness anomaly the previous October in this case. And you can see that corresponding to that thickness anomaly, we did have a positive ice concentration anomaly. And what this means is that even that previous fall, we had, we had more sea ice than normal initially. And then the, I, I should have mentioned this, but the ice concentration anomaly goes to zero. And that's because the Laptev Sea is, is fully freezing over in the winter. So by the time you get to mid-November, it's fully frozen. It's covered by ice completely. There's a few little blips here, which are just associated with storms sweeping over, um, but it's pretty much fully ice covered. Um, but in terms of snow, by virtue of this positive concentration anomaly, we basically had a bigger sea ice platform earlier in the season to start collecting snow. So the, so the, snow, the snow starts collecting in October and it keeps collecting over the course of the full fall and winter. And so we've just had a bit more time. We've had an extra month or so to accumulate a bit more snow on top of the sea ice. And so, so that's one reason why we tend to get more, uh, more snow. Um, and then the, the, the second piece is that the export term is driving the increase in thickness. And a lot of this is happening, in, in this case, the ice is getting thicker due to the fact that ice is converging into the region. And when the ice converges, it tends to ridge on top of each other and that tends to pile snow up on, on top of the sea ice. And then we can, we can rapidly form new thick sea ice in the open leads. And so you tend to get these, these larger sort of snow piles associated with these ridging events of the ice. And so, so, so both those factors tend to increase the snow on the ice. And so when you, when you get, kind of get to this point in May, you had more snow and snow has a higher albedo than sea ice. So we have we have an, an anomalously high albedo, which means we have less melt than normal, which is why we get an increase in the mass associated with the snow. Um, and then kind of going to the second part of the question, um, snow is represented in models, um, somewhat crudely, but it is certainly represented. Um, and so this, this albedo difference between snow and ice is represented in every single model within CMIP. So I think it's getting this kind of basic albedo-based mechanism now it's certain the, the models are not necessarily getting all the details about how the ice ridges and how the snow collects because that's kind of a small scale process that isn't really resolved by the models. Um, but this basic, like the basic sort of aerial based mechanism um, is certainly captured by the models. And I think that's part of the reason why we're seeing this kind of robustly represented across CMIP5. So I think maybe I'll leave it there, but if, if, if you want any follow-ups, feel, feel free to ask. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, we have one more question. Um, we have a question from uh, Dorotea. Dorotea Yovina, she's a research scientist at CMCC here. Okay. Uh, so she's asking, um, 
I'll, I'll read this question then. Um, okay, I'll read this question. So in most of SIMIP, um, SIMIP 5 CIS models, melt ponds and pond refreezing are not represented. So of course that affects the accuracy of simulated CIS concentration thickness and the positive feedback, the ice structure, export and so on. So how does that shortcom affect the quality of uh, results of your results in spring? Yeah, great, great question. I think what, what, what we're suggesting here is that, um, so going back to this plot, um, so most models don't have, like or a good chunk of these models didn't have melt ponds in them in CMIP5. Uh, a few of them, a few of them certainly did, but even the ones that do have melt ponds, they're, they're parameterized, there's probably errors associated with them. I think the fact that this mechanism is represented very robustly across all these models indicates that you don't need a perfect simulation of the details of melt ponds in order to get this mechanism accurately represented. And so I think the key, the key pieces of the ice albedo feedback are more associated with the, the changes in ice area and the changes in snow area, as I just mentioned. And those albedo-based differences are represented in every single CMIP model. And then the other key thing you need is you need some representation of this export term. And in order to get reasonable sort of variability in the export, you need a reasonable representation of storms in the Arctic. Um, now, again, there could be some errors in the storms in the Arctic, but as long as you're getting some degree of synoptic variability, which is kind of stochastically blowing the ice around, you're, you're gonna have this sort of unpredictable thickness feature in the winter. And then I'm arguing that the pieces of the albedo feedback kind of irrespective of melt ponds that are in every model are enough to take those unpredictable anomalies and then kind of make them predictable in the spring. So I think what this is saying is that sort of every CMIP5 model has enough complexity to get this mechanism right. Um, I'm not saying that it's it's correct necessarily. There's certainly details that, that are certainly incorrect in all these models. Um, but it seems that, that those pieces of physics, sort of the synoptic, the, the, res the response of ice to synoptic variability in the atmosphere, and then the basics of snow and sea ice based albedo feedbacks, um, that's in every model and that's enough to give you this predictability barrier feature. Okay, thank you for your answer. Thank you Dorothea for your question. Um, so I can see that um, Johnny Johnson has, um, Johnson, sorry, um, has um, raised their hand. So, can we try and unmute his microphone? Okay, do you hear me? We do, yeah. Thanks very much for a very, very interesting presentation. Uh, my question is um, the role um, ocean waves may play for this um, uh, complicated issue that you are addressing. Notably, it is of course related to the, the wind field, the atmospheric um, circulation um, pattern per se, but they do have this uh, ability to deform the sea ice again. And out of that, um, enhance side melting and increase export. And so do you have any views to that particular uh, situation? As I, it is my understanding that this is not properly managed in, in the CMIP uh, model runs. And, and uh, I wonder how it is for the, your your CFDL flow model and uh, sphere model. Yeah, so um, great, great points. Um, you're 100% correct that um, none of these models, like no CMIP five or six models have any representation of the coupling between waves and sea ice. Um, and, and we know from observational studies and just even just imagery of sea ice that the waves do couple strongly with the sea ice and, and the waves tend to, as you mentioned, deform the sea ice, crack it up and um, the waves are really critical in setting what's called the flow size distribution of the sea ice, which is sort of the, the yeah, the number of flows at a given spatial scale, the, the, the sort of radial distribution of those flow sizes. Um, and so it's thought that the, that putting waves into models is really critical for getting this representation of melt. Um, and so in modern models, um, they tend to use a fixed, a fixed flow radius. Um, and there's an associated side melt just based on the cross-sectional side area of those flows. 
And that side melt term is essentially neg negligible compared to the amount of melt that happens at the top and the bottom of the sea ice. But crucially, as you start breaking flows into smaller and smaller pieces, you get an aspect ratio such that the, the cross-sectional side area is getting much closer to the bottom area, and then the side melt becomes more important. Um, so that's a long-winded way of me saying that I think waves are very important for the ice albedo feedback. And um, people have noted that this side melt term is important in terms of ice albedo feedback, especially because it's the side melt term that actually changes the ice area. And then you get the albedo feedback sort of taking off. Um, so I, I would certainly leave it open on the table that by putting coupled waves into models, it could change the, the character of the predictability barrier quite a bit. Um, I think overall the barrier would still exist, but it, it might change the, the nature of the way that the, the anomalies get enhanced sort of after, the, after the, the sun comes up in May and then you kick off the ice albedo feedback. I think it would probably change the details of the way the ice albedo feedback happens in the Arctic. Um, but yeah, that, those are my comments on that. So not, not really a great answer, but just it's a, it's a great point. I would, I would agree with you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your answer. So we have um, just three minutes left, I think. So probably have time for one more question, if, if anybody has one. Um, if not, uh, we can probably um, stop here. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't see any more questions coming, so maybe more people will get in touch with you after the, the webinar. Uh, so thank you again for, for this presentation. It was really, really interesting. Thank you for being with us and uh, accepting our invitation once again. Um, so thank you, everyone, as well, for attending this webinar. And um, for, don't forget to, to um, also register to the next webinar next week that will uh, end this um, series of, of seminars. Okay, thank you, everyone, and thank you, Mitch, again. Great. Thank, thanks, Elena, and thanks, everybody, for listening. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye.